Good afternoon and welcome back to the meeting. We now move on to our final item of business today, which is further evidence session on the implications of the EU referendum for Scotland. And I'd like to welcome to the meeting David Martin, MEP, and Alan Smith, MEP. Welcome. Uh, before I move to members' questions, I'd like to give both our witnesses the opportunity to make some opening remarks. Who would like to go first? Mr Martin. Alan's kindly volunteered me. <laughs> um, I was doing the water. <laughs> uh, so very brief opening remarks. Firstly, I think in uh, general terms, we naturally here are focusing on the British government's negotiating position. But I think we should consider very seriously how we influence the other parties' negotiating position as well. Uh, and I'm sure you've already thought about it as a committee. But uh, despite his and the way he was reported in the British press, Michel Barney is not at all anti-British. He's not at all unsympathetic to the uh, issues that we will be raising with him. And I think he would be a very good uh, person to, to be in touch with. And, and collectively, we are trying to build contacts with him and his team. Uh, and likewise, Guy Verhofstadt, the uh, Liberal leader in the Parliament, I think from a Scottish perspective, he's shown a great deal of interest in the unique position that we find ourselves in, well, not unique, but the unusual position we find ourselves in of having voted uh, to remain when the rest of the UK has voted to, to leave, and he is very interested in how we can assist uh, the Scottish case. Very, very briefly, and I'll try and do it as telegrammatically as possible, uh, I think there are three things that we need to try and defend as uh, a nation uh, post-Brexit. Firstly, we have to find methods for protecting jobs, we have to find a way of protecting retaining rights, and we have to look at our security, and all of which have been well rehearsed, so again I'll be very brief, but of course in relation to jobs, um, full access to the single market is for me the key issue, uh, and I don't believe we will able, be able to obtain that if we do not have um, some movement on free movement. If we uh, stick to the stated British position of no free movement, then I think we'll find on the other side of the fence no access to the single market or no membership of the single market. And as a passing point since it slipped out unintentionally, uh, uh, I have no idea when we keep hearing government ministers at the moment, British government ministers talking about access to the single market, what they mean by that phrase. Because every country in the world has access to the single market. Uh, it's membership of the single market that gives you the privileged position that we uh, we have. And again, this committee is well aware of all the the options. The Norway option for me uh, is the best option, uh, but uh, I can't understand why we'd want to have no say in setting the rules, still pay the bills, uh, and you know what the advantage of that would be compared to full membership. I, I don't get. Switch option has been talked about, but important for Scotland, important for the UK as a whole. It's been important to bear in mind that the Swiss do not allow free movement of services, so uh, a UK agreement that doesn't give us access to the service market would not be good news. Um, I do most of my work in the Parliament on the International Trade Committee. Uh, I'm actually the spokesman for my group on the Canada Agreement. Uh, it's a good agreement for a third country. It would not be a good agreement for the United Kingdom. And again, I've heard in the last two or three weeks a number of British ministers talk about Canada being a suitable option. I, I won't go through all the options, but um, it doesn't give you unfettered ac access to fishing or agriculture. It more or less gives you tariff-free access for manufacturing goods, but even there, there are some exceptions. It doesn't involve financial services, and it doesn't give you any uh, role in setting standards. If you want to sell into the single market, you have to accept the single market standards. So I don't see why Canada is suddenly becoming this great option for us. Good for Canada, because they're, they have a different relationship with the European Union, but not good for, um, for the United Kingdom. Uh, and finally, on... on, on jobs, the WT op option, um, again, because I do my work in the Trade Committee, I was in, I've just come back from Geneva, where the Secretary of State, Liam Fox, spoke, and I was just telling Alan before the meeting, he um, implied that because the UK was an original member of the WTO and a continued member of the WTO, there would be no problem for us in terms of uh, moving from membership of the European Union to uh, full WTO status. Well, there's no problem in terms of membership, but immediately after 
he spoke, the Deputy Director General of the WTO pointed out that our schedules are 40 years out of date. And he said it would take years to update our schedules. So on the one hand, you had the Secretary of State saying no problem. On the other hand, you had the Director General saying that we are in deep conversation about how we're going to uh, handle this and we expect it to take years. So the idea there's a simple sign up for the WTO option and everything's fine uh, is clearly not a good option. And just as one product, just to mention in passing again, I'm sure you're very aware of this, it would mean a tariff of 10% on our whiskey uh, if we took the WTO option uh, instead of having a completely free access to the European market as it does at the moment. On, on rights, and I'll be much more much brief on the other two things to leave them at time for discussion. On rights, I actually think that there is no way the current British government is going to protect our social uh, and labour rights that we have from the European Union. And here, I, my own personal view is that Scotland should be uh, pushing very hard to make sure that these matters become a Scottish responsibility. So we need to uh, make a case for these being devolved to the, the Scottish Parliament and the Scottish Executive because I think it's clear that the Scottish people do want to defend these rights and it's also clear that if there's no change at the British government level, they will not be uh, defended. In terms of human rights, uh, I think there is a, an argument to say that even with its existing powers, that the uh, Scottish Executive could sign up for the European Convention uh, and could uh, have its own version of the human right, the British Human Rights Act and defend the human rights that we currently have at the European level. And I think these should be a high priority for the uh, Scottish Government. Finally, on security, um, again, it's debatable, but I personally do not think there should be a major impediment for Scotland with its devolved justice system, remaining part of the European arrest warrant system, and also, and again, Collectively, uh, Alan and I are trying to see the uh, see Interpol on, on this issue, and I know that government ministers have also been speaking to Interpol. Uh, I don't see why we couldn't remain, the Scottish police could not be part of Interpol, even if the rest of the UK decide not to, so we can defend our security in that, that way as well. There are many other issues. I think jobs, rights and security are the three key things. Obviously, staying part of the research programme, being part of the Erasmus programme, looking at how we can take advantages of the agriculture and fisheries coming back to, to Scotland, but also being, bearing in mind the dangers of that. If we don't have full access to the single market, it could be difficult for some of our agricultural and fisheries products to compete in Europe. But on, on that, I will stop. Thank you. OK, thank you very much. Mr Smith. Uh, thank you. I I'd, uh, very much endorse everything David's saying. It, it's uh, one of the things that, that is worth stressing to, to fellow parliamentarians that post-Brexit, five out of six of Scotland's representatives in the European Parliament have sat down and committed ourselves to work together, as, as we often have done in, in the past, as, as Team Scotland, and get a result for the people who we serve. So, so there is a, a great deal of cross-party joint working going on across the Parliament. We're seeing that uh, across a number of the UK MEPs, uh, where we are cooperating to try and get the best deal out of whatever is going to be in Scotland's and indeed the UK's future. Uh, I'd also compliment your committee on the work that you've been doing with this inquiry to get a lot of useful information into the public domain. And it's one of the, one, one of the, the, the sad side effects of how dreadful the EU referendum campaign was, that a lot of organisations did not prepare for the eventuality of a leave vote in terms of what the implications are for farming, for fishing, for all sorts of other industries. I was at a meeting with the Law Society of Scotland this morning, and it's clear that only now are a series of organisations really going through the gears in terms of what this actually all means. So the work that your committee has been doing is, is really very, very important. I'd, 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 I'd add a few points in terms of what's going on over the water. Uh, uh, Commissioner uh, well, Barnier and uh, Mr Verhofstadt are very alive to the Scottish question. And my advice to, to, to Scotland and this committee is that Scotland should not be silent as this process is going forward. Uh, the idea that we can wait until we see fully formed what the UK is going to present as the Article 50 demand it, it is an opportunity that I think we need to be taking forward as well uh, in terms of well, what are Scotland's demands out of this? What does Scotland want to keep? What do we want to remain part of? How do we want to, to do that? Uh, because there is a goodwill towards us at present, and uh, it, it, it's, uh, to paraphrase almost everybody who's been involved in politics since Palmerston, uh, countries don't have allies, they have interests. And I think it is up to us to define what our interests are and make sure that we're part of the discussion as that goes forward. And we do have open doors at the moment. Uh, it's an open door that I suspect is going to start closing. And the idea that Article 50 is entirely under the control of the UK, well, all that the treaty says is the member state informs the council. 
arguably that's been done verbally by Prime Minister Cameron in the summit after the meeting. And in the event, the 27, and as, as the UK is going to find out really rapidly, 27 is a bigger number than one. In the event that 27 do decide that Article 50 has in effect been triggered, there's a lot of other stuff going on that the member states of the European Union want to be getting on with. So the idea that the UK can string this out beyond what is reasonable. Now, for the moment, I, I think we need to still have the time to put together what a realistic Article 50 approach actually is. But that goodwill will not last forever, and I do think there is a, a, a time scale there that needs to be uh, respected. Uh, in terms of the plurality of interest uh, of the UK as well, very much, uh, no surprise, supportive of the Scottish Government's and Parliament's efforts to reach out to the plurality of interest within the UK, Gibraltar, Northern Ireland, other places as well. Uh, there is a lot of interest in this that have been thrown up into the air, and we do need to find some sort of joint approach. I believe there is a goodwill at UK official level and indeed politically. Uh, so it, it will take all the talents in this and very happy to continue the discussion with yourselves. Thanks for the invite. Thank you very much. Um, I think from what you've both said is that there is um, there's an understanding within EU institutions and the Parliament of Scotland's unique position. Would you agree with that or is there more work to be done? I think there's always work to be done, and I think there's a, there's a focus that will need to be maintained on that. So the, the, there is a recognition that we voted to remain. There is a recognition that if there's an opportunity to, to find some sort of circumstance that will suit Scotland, then, then let's explore that. I, I think that needs to be issue by issue rather than a wider sort of status. Uh, more preoccupying it actually is the position of Northern Ireland, in that that directly involves another member state which is going to be part of the 27, where we are part of the member state that is not going to be part of the 27. So the, it, the, the, there is an awareness of the situation of Gibraltar as well, but we are fitting within that picture. And the fact that Scotland has been as vocal as we have been immediately post-Brexit did make us very much part of that picture. And uh, that's something that we can use to Scotland's advantage, but we must not go silent within this process. How can this Parliament and this committee most effectively engage with the European Parliament and its committee system to make sure that Scotland's voice is heard? I mean, at the moment, that's quite difficult to say in some ways, in that the Parliament itself, the European Parliament, has not yet decided the form that it's... I think eventually we're going to have a Brexit committee, but we haven't got that yet. We're not there yet. The President has appointed a special representative, Guy Verhofstadt, the leader of the Liberal Group, to be Mr Brexit for the for the Parliament. So initially he would be the, the, the point of contact at the, the present time. But I, I'm hoping that there will be a Brexit committee in the Parliament in the way that we have committees for every, everything else that goes on uh, that will analyse uh, the Article 50 process once it starts. And I, I guess it's because Article 50 hasn't been triggered that we don't have such a committee at the, uh, the present time. One piece of advice I would I would give, um, and I know I'm treading on eggshells trying to put this delicately, but if the Scottish interest, defending the Scottish interest is seen as promoting independence, you will find some hostility in the Parliament, all the usual suspects, the Spanish, the um, a number of other nationalities will be very nervous about this. If it's seen genuinely about promoting the difference between Scotland and the rest of the UK in terms of desires, in terms of European connection, then I think you'll find a sympathetic audience. But it has to be handled very, very delicately. I would, from my own political perspective, very much endorse that. I, I, I think if, if there is a perception, and it would be entirely wrongly, if there is a perception that we're using this as a pretext to a mad dash for independence, there will be a backlash. Whereas if we're dealing with it on a granular level about plucking an example out of the air, how does Scotland continue to be part of the Europol network? That's a discussion that people will engage with. Uh, how do we remain part of Horizon 2020? How do we remain part of Erasmus? How do we remain part of the Hague Convention or whatever else it might be? We can have a granular discussion about technical specifics rather than a broader 
constitutional discussion. There's umpteen places across the EU that have a different constitutional status vis-à-vis -vis their own member state and vis-à-vis -vis the EU. So there's umpteen examples that we can point to for a wider status. But I think as a starter for 10 for where we are now, it's about identifying the bits of the acquis that we want to remain part of and the bits of the framework that we want to continue to be active in going forward, which allows you to engage subject by subject, committee by committee, and uh, I'd, I'd suggest that uh, that's where the discussions actually start, rather than going straight into the Mr. Brexit or Ms. Brexit, whoever they're all going to be in due course, and, and make it more about, well, we want to keep this specific programme going. How do we discuss how to do that? I think that would allow a granular level of discussion, which would be more productive for where we are now. It has been suggested uh, to us that what we need for that to happen is a clear indication from the UK government that they are comfortable with Scotland doing that. What are the chances do you think that the UK government is going to do that? <laughs> <laughs> I, no idea. Right. No idea. It's very difficult to, to judge at the moment what yeah. their attitude will, will be, frankly. But if the UK government did give that indication... It would make life much easier. Make, even in these devolved yeah. areas. Now, yeah. what about, obviously, the key thing is access uh, is membership of the uh, European single market for Scotland. That's what the First Minister has been very clear that she wishes to ret retain. Indeed, the evidence that we're taking so far uh, in the committee suggests that the sectors across Scottish society wish to retain that access. Is that something that we could argue for a differentiated relationship? I think we should argue for, whether it's part of the UK or a bespoke Scottish settlement, we should certainly be arguing for maximum access to the single market. I think there's, there's no question that that's where our economy would benefit most. I think the difficulty is for us, for Scotland to have a different level of access to the single market compared to the rest of the UK, becomes very difficult because goods move so freely across the, uh, the United Kingdom. So how you would uh, identify Scotland as a separate market in that context, it would be uh, close to impossible, I would, I would suggest, in a similar argument with uh, free movement. I mean, there's an indication that the attitude to free movement, sorry, free movement of people, there's an indication that the argument to free movement of people in Scotland is different from the uh, position in the rest of the United Kingdom. But it would be very difficult to have free movement in Scotland with, with a porous border between ourselves and the rest of the United Kingdom. Ross Creer. Thanks very much. Um, <clears throat> taking on board uh, what you've just said about the, the difficulty of a differentiated relationship, uh, would the UK government's negotiating position affect the willingness of the remaining 27 to uh, engage directly with Scotland's specific situation? So if, if the UK government is heading towards hard Brexit, WTO, uh, WTO rules default, would that make the remaining 27 more open to looking at a different, differentiated relationship for Scotland? I mean, it's very difficult to say. One of the paradoxes is the harder the Brexit, the more difficult it is for Scotland to have a differentiated relationship because uh, if it's real hard Brexit, um, then when we're completely out of the single market, it's very difficult for a part of the United Kingdom to be in that that single market. So it actually makes this, this, this situation worse, not, not better. The softer the Brexit, the probably easier it is, in my opinion, to actually have nuances in Scotland's position compared to the rest of the United Kingdom. I mean, what we're hearing in relation to Northern Ireland, I mean, and just in every aspect of Brexit, there are so many variations at the moment. But one, which if I was a unionist, I'd be, a Northern Ireland unionist, I'd be furious about, but one <laughs> One option is uh, actually to have a porous border between the north and south of Ireland, but actually to have a hard border between the north of Ireland and the United Kingdom, which would not be, if, you're a, uh, if you regard yourself as British and living in Northern Ireland, I can imagine that not being a very satisfactory settlement, but it's seen to be one of the few ways that you could keep the border between north and south open. It's Stuart McMillan. Thank you. Um, the, one of the things that the EU has managed to do over the years has been it's been quite a flexible organisation uh, when it has to be. Uh, so notwithstanding obviously what, uh, what's been said uh, thus far, um, where do you see any flexibility uh, for Scotland's position and any, any type of negotiating position for Scotland uh, in, in the coming, certainly in the coming six months to 12, uh, 12 months, particularly because 
of the, the elections that are going to take place in France uh, and then Germany. Kind of several questions in there all at once, but in, in terms of Scotland specific, I think once the heat goes out, and the heat will, might be around for quite a while to come, but once we get into the process, some of the things that Alan and I have already mentioned, uh, I mean, the Erasmus programme, part of the Horizon 2020, um, even Europol, keeping the European arrest warm, those sort of issues, I think there will be flexibility. I think the big problem is the the big issue is the single market, and that's where it's going to be very difficult to get the, uh, the flexibility. In terms of the UK position, um, again, this is corridor talk rather than any formal positions, anybody adopting a position. Uh, one position I'm told that if the British government uh, was prepared to the compromise on free movement of people might be, uh, and it was floated by one of the Brexiteers actually, then he was shot down by the Prime Minister quite quickly, but it's also been talked about in the corridors in Brussels, is the idea that you could have keep free movement in principle, but you would have to have a job offer before you could come to the United Kingdom. So free movement of labour would still exist, but you need your job offer before you came in. Now that's not, some of us would argue, in the spirit of the single market as we currently have it, but it would be a pra pragmatic way of solving what looks like two uh, hard positions that don't seem to be prepared to come, come together. It might be one way of bringing them together. Yeah. Alan? Well, it's, one of the, it, it, it's one of the known unknowns at the moment. Uh, Donald Rumsfeld's uh, quote that there's, there's things you know you don't know, there's, there's things you don't know you don't know, and what the UK position is going to be is actually an opportunity for Scotland in terms of there is, I believe, an open ear, certainly at official level in Whitehall, to, to try and formulate some sort of UK bid at the Article 50 stage, which would actually respect the constitutional issues that have been thrown up for Gibraltar, for Northern Ireland ourselves, uh, the external territories even. There. There, there, there's way wider issues than just, just the home nations. And that is an opportunity for Scotland to be vocal with a list of here's our starting point. Now, politically, our starting point is remain means remain, of course. But let's be specific about the programmes we want to keep, the distinction between what is clearly within devolved competence and things that have other implications. And let's be particularly vocal with the UK about these are the things that we want to have as part of that discussion. I think we do that privately where necessary, but as publicly as we need to. I mean, this is a democratic process. But my point as well being that there's a concurrent discussion that needs to be had with Brussels and the member state capitals to make sure that Scotland's needs within this process are respected. Because then as the two negotiations coincide, we'll have that hopefully goodwill still in the bank in terms of let's find a solution. Uh, we've, we've got Norway just over there, we've got Iceland over there, political Scotland has a, a clear awareness that there's other ways of skinning this. And I think there are ample constitutional examples that we can point to in terms of particular things. Uh, so some of the, the bigger demands about, well, passporting of financial services. I could think of constitutional ways in which we could have passporting of financial services for Scottish domiciled organisations, where perhaps that might not be the case for south of the border. But then that throws into sharp relief how will the situation be within the UK jurisdiction as it stands. So, so I, I think our starting point has to be what do we want to keep? Let's build the consensus in, in Scotland about why we need to do that. And then I think there are constitutional exceptions which can be found in discussions with Brussels. But bearing in mind always that the member state is the member state and there will be one representative in these discussions. But we're not without allies. I mean, we, we, we're having a good discussion with the, the Irish in particular, uh, government to government and then elsewhere. Uh, th there are people that we can talk to about this stuff outside of just allowing the discussion to be a, a narrow channel between Edinburgh and London. There, there, there's a wider discussion we should be having. Uh, on the question regarding the, the elections, uh, taking place in, in France and Germany. Uh, how do you, uh, in terms of their timescales, how do you think that uh, well, these two events are going to, to impinge or, or have an effect upon uh, the situation here in Scotland and also UK-wise? They will have a sig significant impact and you should also throw in the, f to the pot the fact that the Dutch are having elections as well uh, and possibly even of the three they have a bigger 
if you like, anti-European. It's maybe not the right description, but a sceptical audience in, in Holland that uh, will cause them some difficulties as well. So any negotiations that start early next year, if that's, you know, if we believe the rumours of February next year, uh, I don't think we'll, we'll see a lot of progress till October, November. I certainly don't think we'll see any uh, weakening of the Dutch, French or German position before then. In fact, you might well see a hardening of their position uh, before then. So I, th I think they, they do make the, the negotiations complex. There have been some people arguing that we shouldn't even lodge Article 50 until October next year, but I gather the view of that is it's uh, politically unacceptable to wait that long. But I, I suspect the negotiations will not be easy in the first nine months. There's an active danger, I think, that there is an incentive across the 27, because it, it, if the UK establishes the precedent that you can leave and somehow get a better deal, then everything starts to unravel really fast, because you don't need to think too hard about other European countries that have that sort of element within their politics. Hungary leaps to mind, but there's plenty of others. But every single member state will have an interest in this and will be wanting their interests to be looked after in order to approve whatever Brexit eventually turns into. So the, the, the domestic reality of 27 other places is going to be pivotal to what the UK actually gets in the end. The, 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 U, the UK cannot demand terms and get them. Article 50 is just a, a, an opening bid. It's not remotely the end of the process. OK. Uh, my, my final question, just uh, in this area, just as in terms of, I mean, you mentioned yourself, Alan, that uh, in terms of the discussions, it's at member state level. Uh, so in terms of uh, Scotland's contribution to that and uh, the fact that we uh, won't be, we, we don't have that opportunity, um, how, how can you see Scotland actually having that uh, direct level of uh, discussion uh, with uh, some of the European, uh, European countries and um, representatives there, uh, notwithstanding the, the six, or well, five of the six uh, MEPs? Uh, clearly are on the, on the same page, but uh, I mean, it's clearly a challenge for Scotland to really get that message over. It will be, but, but this is where the government has qu cut something of a dash already. I mean, Nicola Sturgeon being over to meet uh, the German foreign minister, uh, Fiona Hislop was over in Paris meeting Arlen Désir uh, just uh, beginning of this week, I believe, uh, very recently. It, the channels will remain open. Now, the, the negotiations will be the negotiations, but we can talk to the people who are part of the negotiations. And we should also, incidentally, be demanding a, part, a formal part of the UK negotiating team, which, which is a very live discussion between Michael Russell and, and David Davis. Uh, if we are silent within this process, decisions will be made on our behalf in Brussels, in Berlin, in Paris, in Ljubljana, and in London. So, so it's up to us to make sure that we are vocal in terms of what we want, and we want a place in those discussions and a seat at that table. And if that's refused, then that's refused, and the, the Constitution is what it is. But uh, we certainly shouldn't allow decisions to be made for us without making the case. Okay. Uh, just, did we have a sub sorry, sorry, Mr. Just, Martin? Uh, just very, very briefly. Just, I mean, I would firstly endorse what Alan says in terms of the First Minister and other ministers keeping contact in Europe and. and you know, it's not going to be easy. People are not going to negotiate at the moment, but nevertheless, having the dialogue, keeping the contacts open is, is vital. The point I wanted to add, though, is, again, as you're well aware, at the end of this process, the European Parliament will have the right to say yes or no to any Brexit deal. So, firstly, that makes a point that's worth speaking uh, to a wider group of MEPs and making sure that MEPs understand your demands. And it's not, I'm not predicting it, but it's not beyond the level of possibility that we will say no to a Brexit initially. We've said no to some big deals in the in the past. So just because the member states have negotiated, don't assume that the Parliament will just rubber rubber stamp it. But on on that point, the point I wanted to add also is, much as I'm always defend the rights of the European Parliament, I think it's ludicrous that if the European Parliament has the right to say yes or no to such a deal, that the Parliaments of the United Kingdom, I mean all the Parliaments of the United Kingdom, don't have that say as well. Point, um, that the European Parliament has the, the chance to say yes or no. Uh, what would happen if the European Parliament did then say no? Uh, what kind of type of uh, constitutional crisis would that uh, <laughs> give a kick up here in, the, uh, in these islands? A big one. <laughs> <laughs> um, th this is 
the problem with the whole Article 50 process, we have never been, we're in, and it's cliche, but we are in uncharted waters. We don't know what would happen. One assumes they'd have to go back to the negotiating table, but we don't know what that means in terms of the two-year time period. We don't know, we, we, we just don't know. In the past, the two most recent examples of Parliament saying no to international agreements was the ACTA agreement, and it simply killed it. Um, and the other one was the uh, passenger name recognition agreement with, with America, and it was that led to the Vice President of America coming to uh, the European Parliament and pleading with us and the nuancing the, you know, the negotiators went away and negotiated the agreement and it became an agreement. So there's two opposite. One killed it, one led to a few months delay and with Brexit it would be impossible to make a, to make a prediction. Okay. It, it'll depend entirely upon the goodwill that starts the negotiations and then continues through the negotiations. If there is goodwill and mutual self-interest, well, a deal can be struck. We're all grown-ups. But the omens aren't good. The pronouncements that we've had out of various London ministers slapped, slapped that's not language I should use, but contradicted almost immediately by their boss, it is just not credible. Uh, you saw the reaction of the French and German foreign ministers when they offered to explain in English how the Lisbon Treaty actually works to Boris Johnson. Uh, it, we're not looking good here. Uh, the, the extent to which the UK is, is, is throwing goodwill away is a problem for us because we're not looking serious, we're not looking credible. But from a Scottish perspective, I think that underlines the need that we need to be vocal and reasonable within where we, where we are. And, and we do have interlocutors within that discussion who will be in the room when, from a UK perspective, will be arm's length to someone who's not going to be in the room. Thank you. Entry on that point, it's Rachel Hamilton, Andros. <laughs> it's a supplementary on uh, Stuart's question. Um, the result of the UK referendum has obviously set a question amongst other member states within the European Union, as we've just alluded to. Um, with this political uncertainty in the other member states, who have a strong populist right-wing view. Uh, do you think this could cause a domino effect of withdrawal from the EU? I don't see it. I, I, I think that the evidence poll-wise is quite the reverse at the moment. Uh, the, the, the way the UK had a vote, then won a vote, then collapsed into chaos it was, a, was, was, was not a good look. Uh, I think there's a number of uh, other anti-European movements that are watching very carefully. I mean, the Front National has a very close relationship with the UKIP group within the European Parliament, and they are obviously comparing notes. And there are indeed ingredients of the same sort of discussion in various European countries. But that underlines our point that there is an incentive on the part of the 27 governments and the institutions of the EU to make this tough in order to pour encourage les autres, in order to specifically underline that you can't leave a club and get a better deal. So I, I, I don't see a domino effect domestically in any particular member state, but the risk of a domino effect actually makes it tougher for us. Ross, was your, was your supplementary in the same? It's on the negotiation process. It's part of what Alan Smith had brought up, if that's... Okay, okay. supplementary. Yeah. Um, so I, Alan, you mentioned uh, that Scotland will have to demand a, a role within the, the negotiation process itself, not just unilateral informal discussions with other member states, but as part of the team that the UK sends to the Brexit negotiations. Uh, that's obviously going to happen in terms of the Scottish Government and the Parliament making representation to the UK Government. But we had the, uh, commission, the representative of Quebec before this committee last week uh, talking about the CETA process that David Martin will be familiar with. Uh, and in that situation, there was an expectation on the European side of the table that the Canadian provinces would be represented in the room, not just federal Canada. And obviously those provinces have considerably more relevant reserve powers than uh, the Scottish Parliament does. But how can we uh, create, if it doesn't already exist, how can we create a level of expectation amongst the other 27 that the UK should bring Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland into the room for the negotiations? The, I mean, we, we should try and create that expectation, but the two situations you're talking about are not, uh, they don't really uh, match. It was actually, the, it was bizarrely the European Union that insisted, or not bizarrely, it was the European Union that insisted the provinces were involved in the Canadian negotiations because of past experience, and that is uh, one of our key demands in terms of the trade negotiations was uh, access to public procurement, which is totally controlled by the provinces, uh, or the bulk of it is controlled by the uh, 
the provinces, uh, and we recognise that any deal that the federal government in Canada did uh, to give us access to public procurement was pointless if we didn't have that guarantee from the provinces. And there was a whole number of other issues as well that are devolved to the provinces that we needed assurances that they would respect. And the Canadian constitutional position is the Canadian government couldn't give away the rights of the, the provinces. So in order to make the deal credible, we insisted that the uh, provinces were involved from the start of the uh, negotiations. Here, unfortunately, the constitutional position is quite clear. The UK government has the right like it or not, to negotiate the terms of Brexit. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't try. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, don't misunderstand the answer. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the question is, how, how do we then try and create that set of circumstances where there's a level of expectation? I think the first fight has to be domestically, but then we also have to look at allies in, in Europe and get them to, they can't insist, but get them to ask questions about has this been discussed with your devolved parliament, your, your, your region? Has, is the Scottish Government on board for, for this? Is the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, been dis had a chance to discuss this? And there are allies in uh, some of the member states who would be prepared to pose such questions, I think. And again, it's a question of going back to the earlier comment about the First Minister uh, speaking to uh, leaders of other member states and to leading members of the European Parliament and to the Commission, uh, getting them engaged in this, this conversation and get, making them aware of it. But we've also got to be, bear in mind, you know, it shouldn't be unrealistic either, that they, as Alan has indicated and we all know, they have also got their, their own concerns about this process and that's for them going to be the number one priority, looking after themselves. I, I, Thanks, I, I, I'd agree with all. Just, just to add briefly, the, the reality of CETA is that it's not deliverable unless the provinces sign up. So they had to be involved in a way that, bluntly, we don't. Uh, it's primarily a political discussion within the UK about the plurality of interests that we all have. The, the unanimity of purpose across Scotland's political parties is, I think, a big strength in terms of that. But also building the coalition with industry groups, farmers, fishermen, whoever it might be, that Scotland has a list of demands which are distinct and legitimate and reasonable that we expect to be represented. And, and the UK constitution is what it is, and we're, we're, we're all familiar with that. But we have people that we can deal with outside of that process. But uh, we, we must not be silent either within the UK context or indeed within the EU, because I, I think we, we do have arms at our disposal. It's an interesting issue that we're unpicking here because in Canada it was quite clear that the, the Canadian provinces don't have treaty making powers, they can have agreements. But similarly in, in the UK there are issues that are very, very clearly devolved to, to Scotland and which are only deliverable in Scotland. And um, I, I would have thought that that would have had a, a bearing on the perception of the Brexit negotiation process. One would hope so, um, but the, the problem is the, the, the constitutional position is that the UK is the, the member state and has not uh, in any sense given international competence to Scotland, Northern Ireland or, or Wales. And therefore, from a European point of view, even if there might be issues in terms of deliverability inside the UK, from a European point of view, the British government signing up for something is all they need in their sense because the British government would be responsible for uh, the delivery. Uh, and many of you will be very familiar with this. I mean, we going back way back to 1997, uh, 98. Part of the reason we have the constitutional settlement we have now is because we learn, if that's the right word, but the, the lessons of Brussels and Belgium uh, were born in mind where Belgium cannot enforce uh, its um, federal constituent parts sometimes to deliver on European policy. And um, in relation to CETA, uh, one of the Belgian uh, parliaments has said that the government shouldn't ratify CETA uh, and unless they change their mind, the Belgian government, even though they have a majority in the, the parliament, the majority in the Belgian government, cannot because the Wallonian government, or the, not even the government, the Wallonian parliament has said they shouldn't sign up for it. At the moment, Belgium can't sign up for CETA. But we're in a different position, like it or not. Emma Harper. Thanks. Um, my specific example um, is about how complex our connections are with the EU. Um, last night, I was at the South Scotland Alliance uh, meeting along with Rachel Hamilton, and they were very keen for me to follow up about the reclassification of the NUTS 2 
um, areas. And if the South Scotland uh, becomes a designated area, then potentially the South Scotland could, um, I guess they could be available with uh, an estimated 970 million euros. And that, I know that's an estimation, so that's about £840 million. So my question is about what is the status or will be the status of the negotiations about the nuts to uh, reclassification for the south of Scotland? Um, is it on a shugly peg? And if it is, can it be salvaged in light of Brexit? That's a good question. <laughs> uh, the, I mean, my own, my own attitude at the moment, and I think five of the six Scottish MEPs have taken the, the same attitude, is that life goes on, we're part of all these systems at the moment, and therefore we should continue to argue for what we would have argued for in the past. And the regional funds qualifying area, the, the level that you qualify at, is, is contentious for really since the regional funds started. And it's clear if nuts to would, because of the statistics, um, unemployment and cap per capita income and so on, NUTS 2 would be a better level than NUTS 3 for the south of Scotland. So there is a, they have a strong case. We will continue to fight that case. Of course, it could be a, 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 a victory because we could win the case and then be out of the European Union. It would make no difference. But if, 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 if you believe that we should continue to do our job, continue to fight for what we think is in the best interest of Scotland for as long as we're members, then I think the argument for a NUTS 2 for these, well, I can't just be for the south of Scotland, but using NUTS, through, NUTS 2 as a base area for regional funding makes a lot of sense for Scotland. Okay, thanks. I'd echo a lot of that. Uh, I'd, I'd, I've been working with the South of Scotland Alliance going back the best part of a decade that uh, if Dumfries and Galloway and Scottish borders were amalgamated into a NUTS 2 region, the numbers would be different. But we must also be aware of the real politic that all of our numbers are stopping quite soon unless something pretty dramatic changes. So, so I, 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 we'll, we'll certainly fight the good fight, but I, I, there's an extent to which that, that horse has bolted. Richard Lockhead. <coughs> Thank you for giving evidence today. I found your contributions quite pessimistic so far. <laughs> in terms of contrasting with the standing ovation that Alan Smith got at uh, the European Parliament from other MEPs. But I'm finding it quite difficult to detect any sign that the MEPs are going to come to Scotland's rescue. And you, in terms of the overall debate, have not really shown much light on how it would be possible for Scotland to maintain a meaningful relationship with Europe. Erasmus, Horizon, Europol are all very important issues for cooperation but it's not really what the big debate is about. The big debate is about the single market, the customs union, the big issues. And you've not really given any indication it's going to be possible for Scotland to maintain that relationship. So you're basically saying to us that MEPs are not going to have much role in this, or much of a role in this, and that without the UK government's green light for the institutions, all the institutions in Europe to speak to us, it's going to be very difficult to make progress. Is that what you're saying to us? I think it is, frankly. Yeah, sorry to be pessimistic. Uh, Try not to be pessimistic, but realistic. I mean, unless the uh, UK government negotiates uh, a good deal in terms of access to the single market, it is very difficult for Scotland to have a, a distinctive relationship with the single market. I think all the issues you've just mentioned, and we've mentioned, it is possible uh, to retain some of the rights, some of the security issues in relation to Europe, but the the jobs part. Uh, employment, I think, is extremely difficult unless we get a better deal from the, you know, the British government negotiates a good deal. I mean, it, just just as a sort of slight aside, but I was, again, I was, we were talking about this earlier. As I said, mentioned earlier, I've just come back from the the WTO, and uh, Liam Fox made great play of um, Britain being a, a free trade country now, and how getting out of Europe is going to open up uh, freedom in terms of our market. And again, better not quote them directly, but since there's three of them, I can hide which one it was. But one of the director generals of the WTO then told us in private, he doesn't seem to understand that we are the World Trade Organization, not the World Free Trade Organization, which I thought was a nice riposte. to him. And for, for my part as well, I mean, it, it, 
the big picture is freedom of movement and single market access or membership, uh, absolutely. But my point about not going silent is let's talk about the things we can talk about. I, I think if you put a motion that Scotland wants to remain part of the Erasmus programme to this parliament, you'd have pretty much cross-party unanimity that this is something we want to do. So there's an earnest of intent that we can talk about with the institutions about here's, here's one way in which we want to remain part of this, here's one way in which we want to remain part of it, and start to get the goodwill in the bank about things that we actually can deliver. Uh, Europol, likewise, uh, Justice and Home Affairs Cooperation, there are ways in which, in any likely scenario, Scotland will be able to be engaged in the way that Norway is or Iceland is or other countries, uh, Switzerland can be. Uh, so while, we, while there's so many unknowns within the process about single market stuff, there are things that we can talk about. So, so let's not go silent and let's be vocal about the direction of travel we want to establish and build some sort of momentum towards that. Uh, meanwhile, concurrent discussions with the UK, etc. The MEPs are not going to ride to our rescue no more than any other member state is. Uh, but, but the MEPs are useful in reaching the member state capitals. The European Parliament is going to get to sign off whatever Brexit is, whatever the terms eventually are. So there's a lot of Line, line, lines in the water that we need to maintain. But uh, it is up to Scotland to work out what are our demands, what are our lists of interests that we want to maintain, and then engage ruthlessly, member state capital by member state capital, as to why that's in their interests also, and why they want to help facilitate that. But the, the strongest key that would perhaps unlock this, am I right in saying, is for Theresa May, for as long as Scotland's part of the United Kingdom, to say at some point, preferably sooner rather than later, that she's happy given the democratic vote in Scotland for the institutions to speak directly to Scotland about how that relationship with Europe can be maintained? Well, she can be as happy or unhappy as she likes. The, the institutions aren't talking to the UK. Uh, Jean-Claude Juncker the and starts, the rest. Once the process starts. Huh? Aye. Uh, and, and, and once there is a negotiation underway, we need to call canny with the institutions, and this is my point about differentiating between Brussels and the member state capitals. Uh, we can have the dialogue with the member state capitals about what our interests are, and then they'll be in the room as the 27 are negotiating with the UK. We also need to have the discussions with the UK about making sure that our interests are properly represented. And that, that will be an, an inelastic process to a point. But in terms of do we need the goodwill or the acquiescence of the UK, I'd, it would be helpful, yes, and, and there, is, there is a degree to which we, we need to establish as much of a joint uh, operation as we can. But there are limits to that process, and, and there is a mandate within Scotland from the people of Scotland, there's a mandate from this parliament, and there's a mandate that I want to see respected. And I think we need to talk about things that are deliverable within Scottish competence, because they are deliverable within Scottish competence, and we can do things about that. And that allows us to establish the earnests of intent to illustrate the wider point that we expect something different out of this process, whatever it's going to be. But that, that's going to be a multi-level discussion. And waiting for the, the say-so of the UK government, I think, will only, will only take us so far within that. Can you see any circumstances in which negotiations between the UK and EU institutions would break down? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Almost immediately, I'd imagine. But, yeah. it, but Article 50 is, it, is an opening bid. Uh, and we've heard much comment about we'll get a lot, of, a lot more clarity once Article 50 is triggered. I, I actually think the moment of clarity comes when the member states say no to the Article 50 bid. Because uh, Charles Grant uh, from the CER has written a very, very helpful paper about the different sets of negotiations. I mean, there isn't just one set of negotiations. That, that ending the treaties is actually quite a straightforward technical matter. It's what comes next is going to be the guts of it. So when the Article 50 bid is put together, which I hope will reflect all of Scotland's interests and I hope will have some sort of scenario that, that respects what we want, it's then up to the 27 to decide whether they acquiesce to that or not. It's then up to the European Parliament to decide whether that suits the interests of the wider population of the European Union. It's then up to the Commission to decide whether that respects the treaties. There's, there's, there's a much more varied set of interests ranged against us than just the UK. And what do you think the key issue would be? Is it free movement of people? Hmm. It comes... I, I mean, there's the... 
there are nitty gritty issues as Alan's described them, I and they are nitty gritty. But even even the formal, if you like, the administrative part of Article 50 could be extremely uh, difficult. The easiest thing might be the day you leave, because that's also going to be in the the agreement. But what happens to Britain's ongoing budgetary contributions? Because there'll be some programmes that run beyond after the period we leave. How much money? Who's going to pay for that? What's going to happen to, not to our pensions, but even that's not unimportant, but there's uh, millions in terms of pension rights for British employees in the Commission and the Parliament and so on. Who's going to take pay that bill? Uh, and there's a whole host of issues like that that, has, that have to be settled as part of the, uh, the, the, the leaving process. And then there's the, in parlo, we hope, but some member states even argue subsequent, and I hope it's not subsequent, but uh, at some point you then have to talk about the future relationship which will be outlined, I understand, in Article 50, but will not be necessarily be detailed in, in Article 50 negotiations. And that is the, the key part. And there, um, that, you know, so if, if, if we assume, and I don't think there's a lot of evidence one would have hoped, but I don't think we can be firmly assured that the British government's lobbying for complete access to the single market. But if the government is looking for membership of the single market, then free movement of people will be the, the crux issue because there are a number of member states who are not going to move, I don't think, on the, the free movement issue. We don't need them all to move because we need 21 out of 27 to agree to the, uh, the Brexit deal. But the Poles, the Hungarians, the Czechs, the Slovaks, the Slovenians, the Lithuanians with uh, population, uh, big populations living in the UK are going to defend their population. So they're, they're not going to give in on, on free movement. And if we believe the British government, they're not going to give in on free movement. So something, something has to go there. If the British government does the Liam Fox position, which is settled for WTO, then I think we've got a very bad deal in terms of the British economy, but getting an agreement from the other member states probably won't be that difficult. You talked about the, the Parliament vetoing any deal. What do you think would be the circumstances in which the Parliament would veto a deal again? Would it be a compromise too far on free movement? I think... Parliament, anything that breaks the... F if, if you get three out of the four, and the obvious fourth one will be the free movement of Labour, but if, if three out of four of the four freedoms that uh, we talk about are, are guaranteed to Britain, but one isn't, um, then, yeah, I think you'd have a problem inside the Parliament. But again, actually, the nitty-gritty issues might also be some of the ones that the Parliament takes uh, umbrage at. I mean, because Parliament is one arm of the budgetary authority. If it doesn't think the budgetary settlement is, is suitable, it could easily reject it on, on that basis as, as well. Um, what happens to all the, uh, the agencies? Uh, will Britain still be part of the agencies or will we give up? I mean, one, one sort of, not critical, but one just sort of off the top of my head, the chemical agency, for example. Every new substance that comes on the market has to be approved by the chemical agency. Um, we are members of that. We pay for that at the moment. Uh, what happens after we leave? Do we just do we have our own chemical agency, which will cost a fortune? Or do we not take part in the chemical agency but accept all the European laws? Or do we pay for it and try and influence it? Uh, and if we're trying to influence from the outside, even that could be controversial inside the Parliament. And you multiply that by, I don't know how many agencies there are now, but you know, go across the Environment Agency, the Food Safety Agency, the whole lot of them. All of these things have to be settled uh, in, in, in our exit. And any one could just trigger... You know, you're all parliamentarians, so you know what happens in parliaments. So just one thing could sort of get a bit of resonance and, and take take legs, and, and then you find there's a, a movement against the the agreement. Very interesting, Ross Greer. Did you have a supplementary on that? Um, very short. It's uh, it is a new point, though. Okay. <laughs> um, if if David Martin will forgive me, just to to go back to uh, what you said about independence, and I uh, agree entirely. Uh, with uh, what you said, having spoken to my own party's colleagues uh, in the Flemish Parliament this weekend, I understand entirely the domestic situations that uh, other countries are taking on board. But would you agree that at the moment it would be irresponsible to take any option off the table because, if nothing else, they're all negotiating tools and points of leverage with the UK government in what could become tense domestic negotiations within the UK? The short answer is, is yes, uh, if you're pushing me harder from my own personal 
position, which I've, I have thought about a lot since the 23rd of uh, uh, June. Frankly, personally, I think the emotional case for independence is much stronger, but the Brexit settlement um, is critical in this. Uh, and I, I don't, this is probably not the place to go into, but a hard Brexit actually makes the case for independence harder, but bizarrely, and a soft Brexit makes it easier. But in terms of negotiating, I think, of course, any negotiator keeps every option on the table, so you should keep every option on the table. I, I, I very much echo that. Uh, I, I, I think as recently as two and a bit years ago, the people of Scotland were told we're a family of nations. And to safeguard our European status, we need to stick with the UK. And then less than two years later, we find ourselves in a really very different situation. So I, I, I absolutely, no surprises, but I absolutely do think independence must be on the table because that gives an urgency to the discussions and a leverage over the UK government. And that, that, that's recognised by, by everybody, not least in Brussels. But it's not our first place to go to. And so much is in flux. I, I, I was in the Sunday Herald just this week about it. Until we can establish what we would become independent from, I, I, I think there's a number of dotted lines into the future where we can only tease so much out as yet. I, I am talking about status within the European framework, which means a lot more things than just membership, which means a lot more things than just single market membership or access or whatever it's going to be. Our starting point I, I, I think cross-party has to be what are Scotland's best interests and then we track back from that uh, in, in the discussions with the UK government and in the discussions with the member state capitals but uh, independence absolutely on the table because that gives us a leverage which giving it up would lose It also has a supplementary just you, Martin to elaborate on this comment about the relationship between hard Brexit and soft Brexit and independence because yeah, with these issues not a question of timing of when things happen Maybe a bit I mean, I just thinking quite narrowly, and I accept there's wider arguments for and against independence, but on the narrow issue of, of jobs, a hard Brexit means that the UK is out of the single market. And if the purpose of independence is to keep Scotland in the single market, then we would face, and this is not, I, I agree, because of the, I've been around the Scottish debate too long, I realise you start getting into difficult arguments here. But the reality is, if Scotland is outside, is inside the European Union, and the rest of the UK is outside the European Union. You need a hard border between Scotland and England, and we have roughly quarter of a million jobs that depend on our trade with the European Union, and a million jobs that depend on our trade with with England. So a hard border in that situation would not be uh, good news. If you have a soft Brexit, that border would not exist, and then you have a more realistic choice about, in my opinion between independence and, and remaining part of uh, the, the European Union. But if you, if, if, if it's one of the paradoxes, but if the UK goes for the hardest possible situation, I think it makes it very difficult for Scotland to retain its economic links the way we have them at the present time with the rest of the UK. And that, in my view, that does a lot of damage, which is what I'm kind of hinting about the emotional versus the, the practical uh, problems of uh, the situation we now f that none of us wanted, but we now face. So the logical conclusion of of your argument is that question on independence, if that were one option, should be settled before Brexit. No, I don't think that is my my argument. My argument is that you, until you know the nature of the Brexit, it's very difficult to know whether. In economic terms, I, I repeat, I know there's much wider debates about independence. I'm trying not to extend the argument in this committee. Uh, we can have the money elsewhere. But, uh, but in, in, in the economic terms, I think a hard, if, if the UK ends up with a hard Brexit, purely on economic basis, it becomes more difficult for Scotland to be independent. On a softer Brexit or a middle Brexit, um, there's an example of Switzerland and, and Liechtenstein, in that Switzerland and Liechtenstein are both in EFTA, but only Liechtenstein is in the EEA, and as I understand that there's some flexibility b between those borders, there isn't a closed border, for example. Um, d does that kind of illustrate the point that you're making, that you could have, if it was a softer Brexit, it's more easy to, easier to have differentiated relationships? Yeah, exactly. If you have a soft Brexit, then there's no need for a border between Scotland and England, even if one of us is in the EU and one's not. If you have a hard Brexit, my argument, my claim is you would need a hard border, uh, and that's where the difficulty comes. And that's going back to the earlier comment about Northern Ireland. Nobody wants to see a hard border between North and South. 
and if we end up in that position, the only way to avoid that between Northern Ireland and, and Ireland, even that would be uh, an ad hoc relationship, would be for the Northern Ireland, bizarrely, to have a hard border with the rest of the United Kingdom, which uh, you know, for a part of a country to have a hard border with a, another part of the country seems to me to be crazy, but it might be the only way of keeping that island uh, together. As you said yourself earlier, and there's certainly unionists in Northern Ireland have told me privately and others, I'm sure, is that that would be completely unacceptable for the unionist community in Northern Ireland. Sure, no, I can imagine it would be. So, uh, but, but um, they, well, sorry, I was going to say they voted for it, but that's uh, <laughs> let's not go there. <laughs> if if I could um, perhaps just go back to a point that you made earlier, Mr. Martin, when you were talking about. Um, the social protection issues, um, which are actually, in, in many cases, they're not in devolved areas, and we seem to have a sort of consensus that Scotland should be able to, you know, negotiate and push in these devolved areas. But obviously, um, social protection employment is not devolved, and you suggested that we should now look at transferring those powers to the Scottish Parliament. That was also a point that was raised by um, Nicola McEwen when she gave evidence to us uh, last week. Um, how quickly do you think that should happen? Uh, as quickly as as possible. Um, I, again, it's sort of moving beyond the realms of this committee, but my own, my own view is whatever happens post-Brexit, the relationship between Scotland and England has been fractured further than it already it really was, and that the there's an argument now, if not for independence, at the very least maximum uh, devolution of, of powers, and we need a, a you know even beyond the diva max we got post the uh, independence referendum, we need a further uh, movement of powers to to Scotland as the only way of actually keeping uh, the relationship uh, workable. I know. Many people don't want to keep it workable, but if you want to keep it workable, I think maximum devolution is now the only the only option. Scotland clearly has indicated that it has a different set of preferences from the bulk of the uh, of England, uh, not even the rest of the UK, but England, uh, and therefore. Yeah, yet again, I think we need to be looking at another constitutional settlement, and among that, I think labour and employment laws is a key element. Yes. Do you think you can take your colleagues in the Labour Party with you on that? Uh, no. I've been, tr I've been desperately trying to walk on eggshells and not be, pa not be party political here, but actually I think you might be surprised that there is a growing movement inside the, the Labour Party as well that recognises that the, there is a, a need for a, a new relationship, but not everybody agrees with that, of course. Well, I think at that point we'll, um, we'll end our session. Thank you very much to both our MEPs for giving the evidence and what is an absolutely fascinating session. Unfortunately, we have to close because we cannot be in session when the Parliament is sitting. So we'll now close this session. Thank you. Thank you.